any business to take that process that is being considered by the House to the court. And I don't want to preempt the judgment of the Supreme Court in this matter. Tonight, Supreme Court and Parliament set on a coalition cause. A Speaker of Parliament warned the APS Court to stay off any attempt to injunct the House on the anti-LGBTQ bill, where the court set to deliver its verdict on an application that may tie Parliament's hands on the matter. We'll hear from the Attorney General. Especially, my submission is that upon the satisfaction of all these steps required under Article 106, there is no room for Parliament on its own to reconsider such a bill. And therefore, there is no provision for a remedy or a cure of a failure to comply with Article 108. And tonight, Parliament and the Supreme Court are set on the coalition cause over whether or not the House uh, and parliamentary business can be truncated by a decision of the court. The Apex Court is set to deliver a verdict that may tie the hands of Parliament, taking further steps on the anti-LGBTQ bill. Ahead of the decision, uh, the Speaker of Parliament, Amon Babuin, has been warning uh, that it is not the business of the court to pry into the conduct of Parliament unless the House finishes what it is planning to do on this building, fulfillment of its constitutional mandate. Now, researcher Dr. Amanda Odoy and journalist Richard De La Sky are before the Apex Court seeking uh, to injunct the transmission of the Human Sexual Rights and Family Values Bill to the President for his assent. Now, the two argue that the private members uh, will, this particular bill will impose a significant charge on the Consolidated Fund and should not have emanated from private members. My colleague Richard Kojonyaku was in court for us on the day when part of this also played out uh, before Parliament and uh, with details. So, first of all, let's go to uh, what happened before the court itself today. So, Evan, so the case were heard differently. So, the first one that was heard was researcher Amanda Odoi's case uh, where uh, the lawyer appeared and said he was filing an application and that is seeking to injunct the transmission of the bill uh, to the president. In fact, it was heavily resisted by a lawyer for uh, the Speaker of Parliament, Tadia Sorry, and the Attorney General also came in. And so uh, that um, rigged on for some time. But what they centered on was Article 108. And let me read Article 108 for your hearing. Uh, Parliament shall not, unless the bill is introduced or the motion is introduced by or on behalf of the President, A, proceed upon a bill including an amendment to a bill that in the opinion of the person presiding makes provision for any of the following i the imposition of tax or the alteration of taxation otherwise than by the reduction or the imposition of a charge on the consolidated fund or other public funds of ghana or the alteration of any such charge otherwise than by reduction or the payment issue or withdrawal from the consolidated fund or other public funds of Ghana of monies not charged on the consolidated fund or any increase in the amount of that payment. In fact, issue or withdrawal. And five, uh, the composition or remission of any debt due to the government of Ghana. And then the B says that to proceed upon a motion, including an amendment to a motion, the effect of which in the opinion of the person presiding, would be to make provision for any of the purposes specified in the paragraphs. And so it was like a chicken and egg situation. So the argument centered on whether Parliament should have proceeded on this bill, knowing very well that it emanated from private members instead of the presidency because it is a charge on the Constitution. We've been speaking with lawyer for um, Amanda Odoi or Richard Delaskai, uh, Parkway Sibedu, and he's been explaining why the court should rule in their favor. Um, the the focus of my submission this morning, as you might have heard, were premised on five main points. The most cardinal point I raised was that under Article 108, Clause A, Subclause Roman Number 2, there's what we call Financial Impact Analysis Report, which should have accompanied 
the bill before its admission by the Speaker of Parliament. And once that was not done, then we are saying that right from the beginning, there was a constitutional breach. And this is what will not let the bill fly. Yes, the Chief Justice says the cases will not be consolidated, considering the similarity with the one earlier held. To your camp, is this welcoming news? Um, um, to be frank, it, it makes no difference to the law. The rule of civil practice is that where cases touch on the same subject and the parties are the same, mm. the case can be brought together or consolidated. But let me also be the first to admit that even where cases are consolidated, the judges are at liberty to give judgment in respect of each case. So the mere fact that they are consolidated or not will not take any away, anything away from our judges. Would you have wished that they did that? Um, to be very honest with you, that is within the remit of our judges, and I do not want to preempt mm. the understanding of the rules. Considering that the, the submissions we are making had already been canvassed by the previous. Let me, let me also go on record saying that although the submissions were very similar, there were other reliefs which the, the, the plaintiff applicant in the instant case was claiming, which were not endorsed mm. on this. So although they might have overheard the same provisions of the constitution being cited now and again, they still had a challenge of looking at those other areas which were not uh -huh, canvassed in the earlier case. You recall that even the Chief Justice drew the first uh, counsel's attention to the fact that there were some relief that is also in this application. Mm. Exactly. And that's why he should confine himself to... So the tangent of yes. our submissions were yeah, so there are two different things. Um, all I told myself was, God bless the Chief Justice when she took the position that this matter has been pending for over a year. And if indeed that controversial report or that report which has remained the bane of controversy in court was with them, why do you wait after arguments? Why do you wait after all has been said and done before you come out to say that such a bill existed? And, and Parliament was really at the heart of this. It was very obvious, we'll hear from the Speaker very uh, shortly, that somehow the Speaker was paying attention to what was happening. After all, it was live, right? So he was watching. Uh, and then you heard from the Attorney General himself, who was very clear, taking on Parliament for proceeding to even consider this bill and even pass it. Why, what, why, what was that point all about? Because according to the Attorney General, the condition precedents were not met and before any bill is laid in Parliament, Parliament should research and should do due diligence. The fact that it was not uh, brought to the floor of Parliament by the executive or by the president. But once it is coming from a private member and it carries on its shoulders financial implication, then Parliament shouldn't have even I mean, proceeded with the hearing and the consideration of the bill at all. There was nothing, no basis on which Parliament could proceed because it was a failure to satisfy the very important position precedent of the speaker or the person presiding presenting an analysis of, of, of the impact on the conciliated fund. And so I would further submit that such an omission cannot be cured by the president's election to refer the bill back to parliament for reconsideration. Indeed, what if, what if the president does not refer the bill, <laughs> bill back to parliament? It means the nation lives with their own conditionality. That would clearly be the implication. If the president decides not to pre present the bill back to Parliament. The nation will live with such unconditionality, and that will be a huge scar on the constitutional landscape of the nation. I simply submit that there is again no independent power of Parliament to reconsider a bill after the processes in Article 106 of the Constitution have been satisfied, which indeed have been up to this stage. Parliament has fully exhausted all the processes of considering a bill. The bill has been introduced in Parliament has been read for the first time as required under Article 106, Clause 4 of the Constitution. It has been referred to the appropriate committee of Parliament under the same Article 104, Clause 4 of the Constitution. There has been a deliberation, especially my submission is that upon the satisfaction of all these steps required under Article 106, there is no room for Parliament on its own to reconsider such a bill. And therefore, there is no provision for a remedy or a cure of a failure to comply with Article 108 
paragraph A of the Constitution. Honorable Attorney General. Yes, Mr. Chief. Did I hear you say that after a bill has been assented to and it's been become an act, that there's no other opportunity? Parliament's rights are exhausted, or Parliament's yes. um, um, capacity, authority is exhausted. Yes, that I cannot, at the stage... I cannot receive the bill on its own. To, on its own. Yes, that at the stage we are, Parliament's power to independently review the bill or provide a remedy or cure as earlier on advocated by my lay friend. That's not exist. Now, the Speaker of Parliament, well, let's put it this way. The Parliament's lawyer was on the, uh, in the, at the Supreme Court today too. Tadio, sorry. What did he say to this? So, contrary to what the Attorney General has been conversing for in court, that once the bill has been laid in Parliament, is going through the various readings and the others, once it is transmitted to the President, Parliament's work is done. In fact, the options left to Parliament are very minimal. Parliament cannot go back and reconsider that. But lawyer for uh, Parliament, Tadia Sorry, indicates that, no, the President has other options available. And so why don't they allow the process, the parliamentary process, to end? And by that, he is referring to the fact that they, upon the transmission of the bill to the President, the President has various options to consider and then review the bill, make comments about it, make suggestions about it, and then the bill can go back to Parliament. But he says that, they are unnecessarily interfering with the business of parliament. The president has a discretion as to what to do with it. And my, my, my lords, I'll just crave your intelligence to read specifically articles 106, one, uh, 7, 8, and 9 of the Constitution quickly. Clause 7 says that where a bill passed by parliament is presented to the president for assent, he shall signify within seven days after the presentation to the speaker that he assents to the bill or that he refuses assent to assent to the bill unless the bill has been referred by the president to the council of state under article 90 of this constitution then clause 8 says where the president refuses assent to a bill he shall within 14 days after the refusal state in the memorandum to the speaker any specific provisions of the bill which in his opinion should be re reconsidered by parliament including his recommendations for amendments if in Inform the Speaker that he has referred the bill to the Council of State for consideration and, comment, and, and comment under Article 90 of this Constitution. Then finally, it's, uh, Clause 9 says, Parliament shall reconsider. When it is sent to Parliament, it shall reconsider. It's where you probably missed what the Attorney General said, that the Article 1081 provides a prerequisite action condition yes a condition precedent such that such that if missed everything done thereafter is invalid but the, I'm, I'm for, gonna, I'm, for, for legality and constitutionality I, I, I didn't miss that point mm. eventually if this court decides mm. that there has been an illegality re by, by reference to the constitution what it will declare is that there is a nullity Mm -hmm. And the question my, my, my lady kept asking me earlier is that if in truth there is an illegality and parliament concedes it, would it correct it or not? So if the president draws parliament's attention to that and parliament agrees with the president and does it, it would have achieved the same question that my lady draws, I have drawn attention to. So again, no need for the injunction. So that, that's my answer to paragraph 10. And that there is lawyer uh, for Parliament, uh, Tadio Sorry, before the Supreme Court today, which, by the way, was live across uh, our platforms here at uh, Jordan News. I want to bring in right now my parliamentary correspondent, because while this was happening and Parliament's lawyer was making the point, the Speaker took the matter to the floor. And quick, quick, how did this happen? What was the context? Well, we were all monitoring proceedings. Parliament had not started because of the rain. A number of MPs are not coming. And so, in fact, at the time Tadio Sorry was making this argument, Parliament itself, had not started sitting. It would appear the Speaker of Parliament was clearly following proceedings and the questioning of the justices, particularly also the, 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 the submission as had been made by lawyers of which is Kai Amanda Odo, and in particular the Attorney General. When proceedings started, Harold Migration raised concerns about a cement ally that is currently before the House and said he may be tempted to go to court if the Minister does not withdraw the ally. The Speaker of Parliament then seized on that moment to really send out a warning, in particular to the judiciary, 
warning that Parliament will not entertain the judiciary extending its tentacles into its business once its job is not done. In particular, he gave the example of a bill and said Parliament's job regarding a bill would not have been done until the president appends a signature to it or not. And until that is done, he does not believe that the Supreme Court or any other court should be entertaining suits from people seeking to question the legitimacy of the work that has been done in the House. Listen to the Speaker of Parliament admonishing MPs to stand up and resist against any such encroachment by the judiciary. Let it be known that when it comes to lawmaking, until all the processes in this house are exhausted, there is no business for anybody, including the courts, to consider. Because the Constitution and the enabling legislation takes care of all these challenges until, if it is a law, it is assented to by the President, judiciary has no jurisdiction to try to pry into it. This is notice. We have to take this seriously, or else our legislative authority is being taken away from us by other agencies and arms of government. That should be resisted by this house. Or else, your being here is of no consequence. The law is very clear on this. And so until a bill is assented to by the president, nobody has any business to take that process that is being considered by the house to the court. And I don't want to preempt the judgment of the Supreme Court in this matter. But I'm giving notice because on daily basis, I'm being served with rates as a party on matters that are being considered by the House. That's why I'm compelled to say this. I mean, this places Parliament firmly on that collision course with the Supreme Court as we await that verdict on the 17th of July. But Kweku, did we get any other comments from other members of, of Parliament to this? Well, not at all, Evans. You clearly hear the Speaker saying that he did not want to preempt that judgment, that verdict that will come from the Supreme Court on the 17th of July. In fact, MPs were all clear in their mind that the Speaker was clearly referring to this case. Just after that, the Speaker suspended his system for about five minutes, and so MPs could not comment on all those matters. Some of them that I spoke to are sort of the floor. Some agreed with the Speaker. Others did say no because they thought that Parliament, as an organ of government, it's still under the Constitution, and so if Parliament conducts itself, even in a lawmaking process, and it falters somewhat, other persons can also go to the judiciary for judicial review. And so when the Speaker returns after that brief suspension, they proceeded to deal with other matters. But the Speaker is clear. He's inviting other MPs to come on board to resist what he calls the encroachment of the lawmaking function of Parliament. This is a tone indeed for uh, some very interesting times ahead as we wait the Supreme Court verdict on this particular matter, whether the processes the Parliament intends to take going forward on the LGBTQ bill uh, can be halted. Uh, an injunction indeed has been uh, applied for, an application for, that is what the uh, Supreme Court will be considering. I want to bring in a member of Parliament, a lawyer himself, who also happens to be uh, one of the sponsors of the anti-LGBTQ bill. He's a co-sponsor, Roxy Nelson, the Fiamepo joins us right now on the phone. Roxing, where do you stand on this debate? Hello, Roxing, can you hear me? Okay, we don't seem to have him. Uh, we'll try and uh, get him quickly on the line on this. Uh, wherever you are, this is Top Story. On the day when the parliament was placed firmly on the collision course uh, with the uh, Supreme Court on that very controversial matter of the anti-LGBTQ bill, the uh, Supreme Court has now been considering this uh, application for an intellectual injunction that would halt uh, parliament and tie its hands from uh, proceeding on this particular matter. You just heard there the speaker say that they will resist.
uh, any attempt uh, by the other bodies, other constitutional bodies or uh, the other arms of government to try and uh, stop them from doing the work that the, he believes the constitution mandates them uh, to do. We'll hear from Roxing Nelson definitely pretty shortly, and I will take your thoughts to here on Top Story. Uh, we'll hear from uh, Roxing Nelson definitely pretty shortly, but uh, still uh, with me in the studio is uh, parliamentary. It's our uh, uh, Court Affairs, uh, Legal Affairs correspondent uh, with me on this uh, particular subject. Uh, so this is going to be on the 17th. Yes. That's so what we expect to hear this. Exactly. So you see, what the court has been saddled with today has been Article 106 and 108. So the 108 borders on the financial implications of bill and anything that will sell, uh, anything that will have an effect, an impact on the consolidated fund all the taxpayers' money, and the 106, the processes the par parliament takes in passing a bill and all of that. So the point really has been that did parliament do due diligence before considering the bill, considering that there is a con constitutional imperative that mandates them to scrutinize the bill, whether it is a private member's bill that has a consequential effect on our economy or our funds. So that is the question that they are asking. And whether parliamentary business ought to be truncated unnecessarily by injuncting the process of the transmission of the bill from parliament to the, uh, the, the president. And so the argument that Tadia Sori has been canvassing for is that parliament has started this business. Why don't you allow Parliament to finish with this business? So it starts from the laying of the bill right to the president, uh, the bill getting to the presidency for the president to assent to the bill or not. If the president does not assent to the bill and then there are other comments, the attorney general, uh, the principal legal advisor of government is there to advise government or offer a legal opinion on that matter, then the matter, the bill will be sent to parliament. But the attorney general today is saying that, no, that is not the process. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Kojo, uh, for that. And I want to uh, stay in Parliament a while longer, where we've heard from the Speaker already on the subject of the uh, Supreme Court's uh, pending consideration of that particular decision on the 17th of July, whether or not to injunct Parliament uh, from taking further prior steps on the anti-LGBTQ bill. And today in Parliament also, uh, the Finance Ministry has been briefed in the House on the very controversial subject of the National Cathedral Project. And we're now beginning to learn a bit more about how much money we have spent as taxpayers on that particular project that looked very stalled. Uh, Kweku Asante is still with me, Kweku. So was this an urgent question that was filed or the finance minister himself came by themselves to brief the House? This was an urgent question that has been in Parliament for more than a year. In fact, for several weeks now, the minority have been making a lot of comments about the need for the business committee chaired by the majority leader to program the finance minister to come. You will recall, Evans, last week that the minority again raised issues about the committee that Parliament was expected to set to investigate the National Cathedral issues and all. The, minister, uh, the, the majority at the time, last Friday, I should say, they respond that the minister will be coming this week to respond to those questions that have been filed. Interestingly, this particular question regarding how much has been spent and whether or not there was an audit was filed by the deputy majority leader, um, Patricia PJ, an NDP MP for Asokwa, who did file this question. So the minister of state and the finance minister, Abdul Asia Sari, is the official who came to respond to these questions, not Dr. Mohamed Amin Lamte himself. Abdul Asia Sari provides an update that since the inception of this project for now, government has been clear that they were providing land and seed funds. And for the seed fund, they've so far provided 339 million Ghana cities since the inception of that project. And the 339 million cities is what has been used for the project so far. It does confirm, she does confirm that value for money audits were done before these monies were released. Listen to her. For money audits um, done on the project in 2021 by Casey. Do you move? Good. Also, a statutory audit of the National Cathedral of Ghana accounts by Deloitte Ghana was started in July 2023 and is ongoing. The auditors had concluded the audit of the 18 months account and the 31st December 2020. Meanwhile, preparations are in place for the auditors to complete the remaining accounts for the period ended 31st December 2021. 
2022 and 2023. I remember that from the onset, from the onset, the, min the Ministry of Finance um, mentioned that our contribution to the National Cathedral will be um, the land and some seed money. And this was in the budget, uh, previous year's budget. I can't state exactly which year, but clearly it was in the budget that we were going to give some seed fund and um, the land as our contribution to that. So, uh, Mr. Speaker, that is what I, I can say to that. But clearly we have records to show how much we have paid. And so it is not something that um, is not transparent enough. We all know how much we have paid. Apart from the Honorable Minister, the former uh, Minister for Finance, Honorable Kenufuriata, whose salary has already been fully committed to the Ghana Institute of Linguistics, Literacy and Bible Translation, Gilbert. The office holders, including His Excellency the President and the Vice President, had related deductions between April and June of 2020, amounting to 1,781,894 um, Ghana City is 38 pesos, and it is shown um, below that uh, in April 2020, um, 81 office holders contributed 637,998 um, Ghana City 77 pesos, and this was on 22nd of June 2020. And May 2020, 82 office holders contributed 638,098. Ghana City, 77 pesos. And in June 2020, 64 office holders contributed 505,796,084 Ghana cities. And so totaling the 1.7 million I mentioned. So 339 million cities spent so far on the National Cathedral. Uh, Kweku, She's also just, uh, we've just been listening to her, updating us on how much the state raised from the donations that they got from ministers on the back of the president's uh, announcement in the, in the heat of the COVID-19 pandemic that he himself and his government officials will donate a whole or part of their salaries towards the fight against the, uh, the pandemic. Yes, um, in fact, that, that question stood in the name of the minority MPs who wanted to know, uh, in particular, Alhassan Sweeney, that the president had clearly made that promise at the height of COVID-19 that his government was going to donate in part or in the whole of their salary. Then he says that 1.78 million CD does not look big enough. And the minister has been responding that it appears all ministers who are MPs did not contribute this way because their salaries are paid from parliament and parliament may not have done this election. And so the 1.78 million CDs that were realized were the president, the vice, and other ministers whose salaries are not directed through parliament. And so that is the information she has been providing to the House in terms of how exactly that amount of money has gone in to help the country's fight against COVID-19 ever. 1.78 million uh, CDs. Thank you very much, Kweku, uh, from Parliament on uh, what has been happening there today. There's a lot more on Newsnight. We start right now.